And Mary Frances, how do we distinguish between the pH negative classical MPNs such as ET, PV, and MF? So we have diagnostic criteria which have evolved over time. The WHO have specific criteria, other groups have refinements of those, but basically we're looking at people with a raised blood count, uh, looking for a, the mar a marker for a clonal disorder like a jack mutation, nipple or calor mutation, and then the bone marrow changes. And the specific criteria for each disorder are set out um, and you distinguish between them on the level of the platelet count, the finding of the mutation and the bone marrow appearances and therefore can make it clearly fall into the group of ET, PV or myelofibrosis. You know, one of the things I find challenging about taking care of patients with MPNs is that sometimes the pathologist says the marrow looks like A and but clinically they're behaving like C. For example, the marrow looks like ET or prefibrotic uh, uh, pre MF, but they have a, a, a high red blood cell count and microcytic uh, indices making me think of, of uh, PV. Have you seen this? And the other part of it is, can patients go from one subtype to another? Well, yes, at the end of the day, what these are are specific diagnostic criteria where at this point in time, it's been said that that's what you need for PV or that's what you need for, for ET. That has changed over time, the, the levels have gone down. And the other point you make is that of what the bone marrow pathology shows. I, of course, in the UK, get the job of reporting the bone marrows as well, as our training is different. And I think you have to accept that there's no absolute marker when you look down a microscope that says this is ET or this is polycythemia vera. Their appearance is consistent with that. Um, and it can be very difficult to distinguish that. One could even argue to make a diagnosis of polycythemia vera. Do you need a bone marrow if you have a JAK2 mutation and somebody with a markedly elevated hemoglobin? Does doing a bone marrow add anything further to that? And I think the final point you're alluding to is, are these actually totally separate diseases or is this a continuum? Um, I'm interested always in what we call diagnostic criteria and what we need to make a diagnosis in, in where we are now. At the moment, we accept the criteria we have, but the big change in this area, of course, was finding the clonal mutations and what we're actually describing are acquired clonal diseases. Is the distinction valid between ET and PV? Time will tell. You know, I know Ruben and Rami want to make comments, but I want to come back to a very important comment that you made <laughs> about our training. In the days of the giants in the United States, we actually did look at bone marrows as well. And so I just want to make that clear. Uh, Ruben? So I think Mary Frances really brought up several important points. But a key one is that the diagnosis of your MPN is not solely on the shoulders of the pathologist. You know, it really is both a, a mixture of the clinical features in the phenotype and the pathology. So I find to do that well, it's really an active conversation between the pathologist and the treating hematologist if they're not one person in the same to really most accurately classify the diseases. I think all of the other parts of molecular phenotype, you know, all of those increasingly I think will add to that, uh, to that understanding. But, but the clinical phenotype and presentation is really uh, key, both for initial diagnosis but also for the issue as we discuss later of progression. Yeah, and the other challenge I wanted to add is basically in distinguishing those from other diseases such as myodysplastic syndrome. So often the megakaryocytic atypia or proliferation sometimes is described as dysplasia. So we have a lot of patients that are referred as that this is MDS, but when our hematopathologist would look at those slides, they would say this is classical megakaryocytic proliferation, this is not megakaryocytic dysplasia. So they are often sometimes, especially if the patients present with cytopenia, labeled as MDS rather than MPN. And I totally agree with the point. I think the clinical phenotype we see is really probably a reflection of the molecular phenotype that we started learning about. And it's probably the combination of mutations, their sequence is what determines the clinical behavior that we see for those patients. Well, exactly, and that's one of the things I find most challenging. Uh, you know, it was Damashek who many, many years ago, when he saw these patients with myeloproliferative disorders, said, well, someday we're gonna find out that these are due to abnormalities in the normal signaling patterns that govern hematopoiesis. And we've done that. But quite frankly, the list of mutations is pretty similar 
in each of the diseases, the frequencies might change a little bit. And so do we really have an understanding of how these mutations lead to the different phenotypes? Is there any understanding there, or are we still learning? I, I, I think in many ways, truly, we're still learning. You know, we get calreticulin uh, may behave pathogenetically in a slightly different fashion than, than JAK2 V617F, but of course we could see it in patients with early ET or advanced MF. Uh, so I think we're learning parts, but I don't think we necessarily have found uh, how the mutations fit into this issue of, of progression. Yeah, and obviously it's very challenging to, to understand those because I think the process is very complex. Uh, <clears throat> but there is definitely, you know, a clinical phenotype that's a reflection for some of those mutations or like the sequence of those mutations. So I think there had been like some studies whether like the TET2 happens before the JAK2 mutation, you'd see a certain clinical phenotype versus the other way, uh, whether it's like a, you know, homozygotic or, you know, mutation in the JAK2. Uh, we've been looking recently to try to see can we distinguish or like, classify the patients based on the mutation alone without the clinical phenotype. I don't think we are there. Uh, and then there is, for example, the entity we talk about now as triple negative. Are those really true MPNs? Could there, those be an overlap of MDS MPN? So I think we are not there yet, but definitely had you know, better understanding than we had a few years ago. I think we call them triple negatives because we want to be as cool as the breast cancer doctors, 